Hello, it's John Heaton, and another topic I thought of doing, which I'm going to do now, is choose 10 albums that I was disappointed by on release. A uh, couple of rules here, I have to have bought the album at the time. So a couple of albums I'm disappointed by I got to retrospectively, or I didn't even bother buying. Um, I can think of a couple of examples like Let's Dance David Bowie, based on the singles, I didn't bother buying the album and I never have bought it since. I found it way too commercial and not as interesting as, um, not as interesting by far compared to Scary Monsters and Super Creeps, the, the previous album. And then The Hunter by Blondie um, is an album I didn't bother buying at the time. It's obviously the weak link in the chain, but I guess by, that, by the time the album came out, ex expectations were not in the sky, up in the sky, because the Auto American had already preceded it and wasn't, wasn't top notch either. So these ones, again, I haven't ranked them. And uh, when I say disappointed, it doesn't mean they're bad albums, all of them, some of them are. Um, but it means compared to my expectations, like, and in some cases the expectations were very high because the previous album had been so good, hence I was disappointed. And in some cases, the albums I'm going to show here are not bad albums at all. It's just that compared to what I was expecting or hoping for, they disappointed, okay? So again, don't take it personally if some of your favorite albums are in here. This is only my opinion. It's just a bit of fun, nothing serious, okay? So we start off this chronological order. Elton John's Victim of Love, released as the follow-up to A Single Man, which was the first Elton album I had. I loved it. It was the first album I got into virtually from anyone. I learned to play Song for Guy on the piano, and then this piece of garbage came out the following year. It's Elton doing cover songs and uh, recorded in Germany um, with this kind of disco feel, and uh, I think Elton himself doesn't rate it. Um, this album from ACDC is next, 1981. It was the follow-up to Back in Black, which obviously had been a tour de force and uh, showed that they could continue without Bon Scott and produce a pretty damn classic album. I mean, it's, it wasn't brilliant all the way through, but it was pretty consistent. This one, uh, high, high hopes for this, good cover, nothing wrong with that. But if you look, at the, if I look at the track listing, I think Evil Walks and COD put the finger on you Let's get it up. Those four are the only ones which uh, make the grade for me. That, so that was disappointing. And we've got Roger Waters' first solo album. So after the final cut, and uh, yeah, after that, Pink Floyd hadn't quite split up by that stage, but they were looking like they, they were about to. And then Roger came up with the solo album. And after the material he'd been writing on the final cut, expectations were high. And then, you know, th not only this was, was this strange subject matter, um, it was just not very, not very strong, melodically, and uh, the songs don't really stand out. This, I mean, it's, it's a concept album, if you like. Um, it's got its moments, like the 501 song is good, and the title track is, is um, pretty decent, although it's got an unfortunate dig uh, against Yoko Ono, which I don't like too much. But on the whole, disappointing, as was Roger's second solo album, Radio Chaos, but that was the first one which was which disappointed and then we've got Stevie Wonder's album from 1985 in Square Circle I think it was the first album I bought immediately on release I had Hotter Than July but I don't think I would bought it on the day of release so I was looking forward to getting this I guess, I guess my expectations weren't massive because Stevie had already gone sort of quite commercial with I Just Called to Say I Love You the, from the previous year which was on the soundtrack to a film but I expected this to be a return to form and, you know, on a par with Hotter Than July, and it just isn't, I'm afraid. I mean, it's got Overjoyed on it, which was quite a nice single. But on the whole, disappointing. Um, Clapton's up next from the same year, 1985. Uh, I'd loved Money and Cigarettes, the previous album. And then this album came along, and it was produced by Phil Collins, and in my opinion, overproduced, and he gets this heavy drum sound, provided by himself, I seem to remember. Um, and it just doesn't suit the material. Um, it just sounds very 80s, which I don't know it was from the 80s, so it should sound as 80s. Um, but I just, 
think the the songs are not all bad. Well, let me see. Some of them are. See What Love Can Do is a favourite. Knock On Wood is a good cover tune with great bass playing from Donald Duck Dunn. Forever Man is a decent cover. In terms of the ones that Clapton wrote, uh, phew, well, I can't see any real standouts on here. There's a very boring num blues number called Same Old Blues. And there's a tiresome opener called She's Waiting. Tangled in Love's okay, and the, the last track, Behind the Sun, probably the nicest song on the album, which is about his split from Patty. So but I was disappointed by that, and then after that, you know, August was even worse. Um, Journeyman was a slight recovery. Um, this is 1986 album from Dylan, Knocked Out Loaded, and I, this had very few redeeming features. I mean, the previous years, Empire Burlesque had been disappointing compared to Infidels. But at least it had a few decent tracks on it. This one, I don't even like the Brownsville Girl um, track, which everyone raves about. Um, and a, there's a lot of cover songs on here. I guess Brownsville Girl's okay, but you know, in terms of epicness, it's it's not really there. It's um, it was a very forgettable album and very disappointing. And Down in the Groove from '87 was believe it or not even worse so but that was the first one which was a real disappointment from Bob um, then what have we got next from the same year Balance of Power ELO's swan song I guess again expectations were not massive because secret messages had been a slight disappointment from 83 um, but this one and they hadn't had a hit for three years by the time this album came out Calling America was a successful hit song and is okay. I quite like So Serious, but there's very little to write home about on this album. I think it's easily their weakest if you exclude their very early stuff. Um, and Armchair Theatre, the, the solo album, was a, was a return to form three years later. And I think Jeff Lynne in general did a better job producing other people's stuff than he did his own. From, for a while anyway. I mean, the, the last, he's come up with some fairly decent latter-day ELO material, but I'm afraid towards the end of the ELO's first incarnation, or, or last, you know, when they were together as a band, as opposed to just solo, um, it's, it's not good. I think it's a picture. So, Balance of Power. Th this album is the follow-up to Julian Lennon's debut, Volot, which was a very strong debut from 1984. And uh, so expectations were pretty high, and this was a, this was a pretty dreadful album. Nothing really to, to redeem it. No, no decent songs compared to the first album. The first album really did have a lot of track, good tracks, like On the Phone. Um, I think you seem to remember most of side one was, was decent and a couple on side two on Volot, but no, that's not the case here. And then this is a bit controversial, this one. So I'm going to show it. It was disappointing for me on the whole, just because mainly I was expecting another masterpiece like Graceland. And it, it was, it smacked of being a little bit volume two of Graceland and Paul Simon thinking, well, I had a lot of success um, playing South African black music on Graceland. Let's let's try South America next, shall we? And um, it just had a, a bit of a, you know, the Graceland Mark II. Slightly inferior in most respects. The opener, The Obvious Child, is pretty decent. Too much drums on it for my liking. But it's not a patch on the boy in the bubble. Can't Run But is a really nice tune next up. But again sort of dominated by the rhythm section and as is the whole album really uh, and not not as good as the, t the second track on Graceland so having said that I quite like The Coast, I like Proof I, I quite like a lot of it it's just compared to what I was expecting it just didn't match up to that it may sound a bit harsh and I'll probably go and try and rediscover it because I just bought the uncut Ultimate Music Guide of Simon and Garfunkel, so I've been reading all their reviews of that. And um, so that, as with all the uncut magazines, that gets you back into the, the albums. And then the last one on my list, I've got Ringo's I Want to Be Santa Claus. Now, up until this point, I could defend Ringo's stuff against all comers, really. Um, but I find it hard to defend this. Well, I did at the time, and I do now. It was... 
the first of his uh, increasingly weaker solo albums in general from this point on. This was the first one though, so this is why I've chosen it because um, I'm not sure what he was thinking. Mark Hudson is involved. Uh, on the back you've got Santa Claus, I Want to Be Ringo Starr, it's a joke, it's not very funny and it's not a very good album at all. And it's quite embarrassing and I don't say that, if you've watched my channel you know that I love a lot of Ringo's stuff, not that album. So those were 10 albums which I was disappointed with for various reasons at the time of release. Um, not all, not because they were all ter terrible albums, just because they didn't match my expectations. So thank you for watching. See you next time.